Church family and friends, um, thank you everyone to get us this far. We are actually running a little bit behind, um, I, um, so we might be a, a little bit longer. Um, yeah, we're just running a little bit behind. Um, I don't know if you understood that last um, scripture reading, is um, we need to have deep roots, um, and particularly in understanding um, what the scripture says. Now, for me personally, um, what I'm sharing, I, it's just about a message that I'll share if this was the last message I'll share with you. That's how deep I feel about this message. Um, last week I was to preach, but um, the new pastor asked if he'd step aside. Uh, I can step aside and he can preach. I said, yeah, no problem. And Laurie Landers was supposed to be on this week, but something went wrong and I'm here. Um, but I know why I had to wait that extra week. Because if I preached last week, I felt like that I had to go out on a limb um, to share what I'm going to share this morning. But on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, I got a huge revelation from our commentary. Um, so I think that backs uh, where my thinking is. I think it's amazing when um, God shares things with you. You see things from a particular view uh, and you see spiritually uh, and then you go and research it and it's all there com- confirmed with our forefathers, with our, the spirit of prophecy through Ellen White, through the Bible. And so this is what I want to share with you um, today. Um, right in the beginning, um, I, I, can I get some slides up here? The title is Let There Be Light, To Know God. Um, the Bible is a story about God and Jesus says, and it is they, which is the scriptures, that bear witness about me. That's John 5:39. So I want to ask you, right in the beginning, what is Jesus' first command? Does anyone know the very first command in the Bible as we open it and read it? What is it? Oh, wow. From the um, mouth of a babe. Thank you. Let there be light. Now, is this light um, that's working? Yeah. Is this light a literal light or a spiritual light? Someone says spiritual? I can't hear properly. Okay. Thank you. Um, before I, 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 I want to ask this question. Why say, let there be light? Good morning. Good morning. Church family and friends, um, thank you everyone to get us this far. We are actually running a little bit behind. Um, I, um, so we might be a, a little bit longer um, yeah, we're just running a little bit behind. Um, I don't know if you understood that last um, scripture reading is um, we need to have deep roots um, and particularly in understanding um, what the scripture says. Now for me personally, um, what I'm sharing, I, it's just about a message that I'll share if this was the last message I'll share with you. That's how deep I feel about this message. Um, Last week I was to preach, but um, the new pastor asked if he'd step aside. Uh, I can step aside and he can preach. I said, yeah, no problem. And Laurie Landers was supposed to be on this week, but something went wrong and I'm here. Um, But I know why I had to wait that extra week. Because if I preached last week, I felt like that I had to go out on a limb um, to share what I'm going to share this morning. But on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, I got a huge revelation from our commentary. Um, So I think that backs uh, where my thinking is. I think it's amazing when um, God shares things with you. You see things from a particular view uh, and you see spiritually uh, and then you go and research it and it's all there com- confirmed with our forefathers, with our, the spirit of prophecy through Ellen White, through the Bible. And so this is what I want to share with you um, today. Um, right in the beginning, um, I, I, can I get some slides up here? The title is Let There Be Light, To Know God. Um, The Bible is a story about God and Jesus says, and it is they, which is the scriptures, that bear witness about me. That's John 5, 39. So I want to ask you, right in the beginning, what is Jesus' first command? Does anyone know the very first command in the Bible as we open it and read it? What is it? Oh, wow. From the mouth of a babe. Thank you. Let there be light. Now, is this light 
um, that's working? Yeah. Is this light a literal light or a spiritual light? Someone say spiritual. I can't hear properly. Okay. Thank you. Um, before I, 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 I want to ask this question. Why say, let there be light? There was an entity. Okay. The, the, what I'm trying to get is, why say, let there be light, if there was no need for it? Um, and if it's spiritual, who is God talking to at that stage? There was no humans, so if it's spiritual and he's saying, let there be light, who's he talking to? The angelic world. Is it, would that be correct? There's no humans there. Um, is it done in a context? Is there a problem in the universe at that stage? Yes or no? No or yes? Okay, some say yes. I believe... I believe as Seventh-day Adventists we're very privileged to see something that others don't. We've got the great controversy. Now, before creation week, where did Satan fall? Before, um, before God created this earth or after it? I'm hearing both. You know, we are privileged to know that as before. You try and discuss that with um, other denominations and this is my point. I walked into this church 14 years ago and I swear to you, if it wasn't for our teachings, I could not have deep roots. Okay, so what, this is what I'm sharing. So I'm hoping something that you see something. Genesis 1-3, God said, I command light to shine and the light started shining. And I was, we established there's a problem um, in the universe. Who said this? Who was, who was the agent who spoke, let there be light? Was it Jesus? Okay, now, do you realise that is so significant? Because you'll see why as we go along. Um, and obviously because there's a war in heaven, God has to do something about it. And just remember, in the, I'm speaking from the context of let there be light, that there's something already has happened in the background. Um, that's, what, that's what we're looking at. Now, if we look at our fundamental belief number eight, it was over God's character. Now, this is where the light's going to start shining. Now, if we go to our own commentary, look what it says. Um, this is on Let There Be Light from our own commentary. Light has been a symbol of divine presence, as physical light is essential to physical life. So divine light is necessary. Rational beings are to have moral and spiritual life. God is light. So I want to go from that side on the spiritual light. And like my question was, was, why was Jesus the one to say, let there be light? And we're going to go through this, some spirit of prophecy quotes and through some Bible readings as well. But the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. And if you get that right at that point, well, there's no man. Um, it was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might, may, might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. But it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. And my question is, why? Because someone has said something against God already. Um, when Satan was thrust out of heaven, he determined to make the king, earth his kingdom. Um, do you understand what's happened here? Um, so if... The, if um, the war happened before creation week then someone was here on the earth already. Okay, now I'm saying that is Satan. And this is, he's trying to make this his kingdom. To, to this result of his great sacrifice, it's influence upon the intelligence of other worlds as well as upon man. The Saviour looked forward when just before his crucifixion he he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now that comes from patriarchs and prophets, obviously it's scripture. But if you notice, it says all. Some of our Bibles, it says all men. The men have been added. 
which means is the whole universe is for the reason for the crucifixion, which is really interesting because when you think about it, angels, did they sin? Yeah, have a look at that and you'll see that. This is a direct quote from Ellen White, um, obviously scripture as well. Christ undertook to redeem man and to rescue the world from the grasp of Satan. The great controversy began in heaven was to be decided. Now look how brilliant from God this is. Um, began in heaven was to be decided in the very world, on the very same field that Satan claimed as his. If you follow that thinking, that is absolutely stunning and brilliant. Because, let's, okay, there's a controversy that started, and it's on the earth, and Jesus comes and says, let there be light on the very territory that Satan claims his own. I don't know if what you think of that, but I actually think that's brilliant. Because rather than putting uh, Satan in, in a dark corner of the universe and forgetting about him, it's on his turf he's going to vindicate himself. I don't know whether that's to you, but that swings me out. Um, now, through the Son, and God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's death on the cross and so brought it back to himself all things, both on earth and as in heaven. Um, Christ, the outshining of the Father's glory, came to the world as its light. He came to represent God to men. I'm going to ask you a simple question. I want you to think about this one. What's that got to do with let there be light? Just read that statement carefully and you tell me, has that got anything to do with let there be light? You're not sure? This is what I found this week. If we go to our commentary, this is what blew me away on Tuesday night. If we go to our commentary... Um, right, this is our Genesis commentary. At the end of each chapter, there's uh, E.G. White quotes. Is that correct? Are you familiar with that? No? Is that okay? Right. Can you confirm with me, Bev, that on um, chapter one, verse two and three, it's got PK seven one seven seven one seven. That's what it's got on it. That that quote. It's got, on our commentary, it's got that. So when, what, what we're saying is, let there be light, that's what it's got to do with it. Christ, the outshining of the Father's glory, came to the world as light, as its light. He came to represent God to men. Does that put a different spin on let there be light? To me it does. It's absolutely huge. Because we're looking into the spiritual world and getting deep deep now into the roots. Um, that is verse, that's eight, is it? Do you, do you put more weight on Jesus' first words um, when let there be light, knowing in the background that the war in heaven has taken place and the devil is in the background on the earth and this is his kingdom of darkness? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, void, and darkness was over the deep surface of the deep. And the, spirit, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. The word formless, which is tohu, is a worse thing. Um, chaos and desert, confusion and empty place. Now, either that is always either talking spiritually or it's literal. Now, I'm going to take that as a, uh, a spiritual meaning. A void is undistinguishable ruin. Now, is it a literal place or is it an undistinguishable ruin because Satan is on the earth? Now, do you think when the Bible says formless, void and darkness that it is a, there is a spiritual application to this? Well, if we go anywhere else in the Bible do we see the, the language somewhere else and, and it can give us a definition of it? If we go to Jeremiah 4.20, it goes, One disaster follows another. The whole country is left in ruins. We're going to get a definition now. Suddenly our tents are destroyed, the curtains are torn to pieces. How long must I see the battle raging and hear the blast of the trumpets? Now listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says, My people are stupid. 
They don't know me. They are like uh, foolish children. They have, um, they have no understanding. Did you pick that up? There's no understanding. They are experts at doing what is evil, but failures at doing what is right. I looked at the earth. Now there's a definition. It was barren, waste, formless and void, at the sky where there was no light. How does he describe a group of people when, there's no understand, when they don't understand God? He gives you a definition. If we go to the King James Version, look what it says. I think it please says it a bit more clearer. My peop- for my people is, fool- is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children and they have none understanding. And they are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and, and the heavens and there was no light. Now, can I suggest to you, if the, if the Satan was cast on the earth and it's spiritual darkness, do you think they know God? No, it's obviously they don't. No, they don't. Isn't it fascinating? Um, now, Jesus does something in creation week that the, in the, that the universe has never seen before. He creates man in his image of God. And I'm going to ask a question, why? Because here we have something that's really huge. We have man created after the controversy. And I'm going to ask a question, why? Do you think we're going to have a special role in the great controversy? Why wasn't he not created before, before that? Do you, think, um, do you think it has anything to do with the great controversy? Now, um, now watch Helen White here. She's just brilliant. Man was God's workmanship, made after his image, endowed with talents and fitted for a high destiny. The question is, how high is that destiny? I don't know if you get this, but if you've seen the line of the story, we are created after the great controversy and we're fitted for a great destiny. I believe we have a huge role in the great controversy. Does that make sense? How high is this destiny? I'm going to go to Jesus himself. John 14, verse 12. I tell you for certain that if you have faith in me, you will do the same things that I am doing. Now listen to this. You will do even greater things now that I am going back to my Father. Greater things than Jesus. I didn't say it. Jesus himself said it. I'm going to answer this at the end of the sermon, what it is. We're going to go through it and you tell me what you think um, our, our role is and how much greater it is. Because can anyone walk on water? Can anyone create a universe? Can anyone raise people from the dead? So is it that or is it something else? And there's a key to that, which I'll get to, It goes because now he's going to the Father. So there's a role that we're going to take over. And this is my suggestion. You will not feel your high destiny or do greater things than Jesus if you don't understand Jesus' mission on the earth. Satan has worked hard in making the earth spiritually dark and was successful into pulling Adam and Eve into the lies he told about God and therefore because they believed the lies they could not trust God and were afraid of him. Thank you Tamara, that was excellent. Can we trust God? Thank you. <laughs> um, now, at times Satan's contest for the control of the human family appeared to be crowned with success during the ages preceding the first advent of Christ, the world seemed almost wholly under the sway of Prince of Darkness. And he ruled with a terrible power as though through the sin of our first kin parents, the kingdoms of the world had become his by, uh, become his by right. Even the covenant people whom God had chosen to preserve the world, the knowledge of himself had so far departed from him that they had lost all true conception of his character. Now that is startling because here we got his own people and if you're here for my last sermon which I preached on the wrath of God, you would realise that the judgments of God fell on Jerusalem which was his people and they didn't know him. But they were doing all the right things of course. Um, 
I want you to listen to Ellen White because I want to draw a, 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 a contrast between what, what um, the prophets speak to us and what Jesus speaks to us. The Saviour had not come to set aside what the patriarchs and prophets had spoken, for he himself had spoken through these representative men. All the truths of God's word came from him. But these prophecies gems had been placed in the false settings. And I want you to pick that up, that they were placed in a false setting. Their precious light had been made to minister to error. God desired them to be removed from their settings of error and replaced in the framework of truth. The work only a divine hand could accomplish. By its connection with error, the truth had been served in the cause of the enemy of God and man. Christ had come to place it where it would glorify God and work the salvation of humanity. Um, that is a real startling... Um, she's, she, that is really startling if you um, see it because she's saying that um, in the past the framework was placed in error. And, and you'll come and see your reason why soon. Matthew 4 says, The people who live in darkness will see a great light on those who live in dark land of death, the light will shine. And who was that light? It was Jesus Christ himself coming in amongst us. And the question I'm asking is, what was this great light all about? What was it to do? Here we have a contrast. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. In the past God spoke to ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he, um, he had spoken to us through his son. He is the one, whom, the one through whom God created the universe, the one who God had chosen to possess all things. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of his being. So if he came to do something, what did he come to reveal? Verse 3 tells Um, tells me what he did Um, and it's in the red he is the exact likeness of God's own being could we say that about the prophets we couldn't could we so can you see a distinction between the prophets and Jesus Jesus is exactly like God the prophets are not so when when I believe Ellen White's saying it is a place in the framework of error I don't think it's deliberate they, they reveal God the best they could, but because they're human and sinners, it was still a little bit muddled up. Does that make sense? Jesus is the full revelation. The New Testament reveals that Jesus showed up finally to give us the true picture of, of the Father, to show us what the Father is really like, to show us the full revelation of the Father. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, there is not a lot of images, there's only one image. Um, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Do, do, do you get the, how profound that, that is? The fullness of God dwelling in a human being, and that was Christ. I want to make a distinction between him and every other being, created being, obviously. In other words, it wasn't part of God that dwelt in Christ, or some of God dwelt in Christ. It means all of God dwelt in Christ and God was pleased with this revelation of himself. You see here, um, because, you know what it says, pleased, it was, God was pleased with him? Because um, you can, can't get any distorted pictures of what God looks like in Christ. But if you look to me, you will. I only can, I only can give you a glimpse. Colossians 2.9 says, In Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form and all means all. It's not that some of God dwelt in Christ. No, all of God dwelt in Christ. But then Paul says all of the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ. It wasn't some aspect of God that dwelt in Christ or one attribute that dwelt in Christ or one side of God dwelt in Christ. But all the fullness of God dwelt in Christ. So what Paul is saying is all the fullness of what makes God God dwelt in Christ in bodily form. Do we understand that? You can't, um, you can't get it clearer than that. He couldn't have said it more forcefully. So if you want to know what God looks like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know what all of God is like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know what all the fullness of God looks like, you look to Jesus. 
If you want to know what makes God God, you look to Jesus. And you can't say that about anything else or anybody else. John 1.15 says, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. Uh, John testifies concerning him, concerning Christ. He, he cried out that this is he whom um, I said he comes after me, has surpassed me because he was before me. What he is saying that there is one who is coming after me who is greater than me because he was before me because the word was there from the beginning of, with God. So, of course, he is greater than Jesus, the, greater than John. Jesus is greater than John, of course, because he is divine and Jesus agrees with him. In other words, Jesus trumps all previous revelations. John 5.36 says, I have testimony, which is a witness or revelation, that is weightier than that of John. The significance here that John is the greatest of the prophets and there's a, a comparison between John and Jesus. Uh, and Jesus is telling you that he's much greater. The word weighty is megas, which means greater, more important, has more authority, more gravity to it. So John's stuff was good, but Jesus' stuff is mega good. John was divinely inspired about what he taught, but what Jesus teaches has more weight than that of John, Um, which shows in itself that the whole Bible is inspired, but that does not mean that all scripture has equal weight. Equal authority, and to some, some degree we already know that because um, the Old Testament asks to do sacrifices and I don't see us doing sacrifices here on Sabbath. Um, and then we get to an interesting point where it goes, Matthew 11, 11, it goes, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has been not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So if John was the greatest prophet up to Jesus and Jesus had a mega authority compared to John, where does that place Jesus related to the Old Testament or anything else? Do the maths here. If John is greater than all the Old Testament writers and Jesus is greater than John, then Jesus has more authority, more importance than the Old Testament, which I believe you, you cannot get valid pictures from the Old Testament of what God looks like. The Old Testament said some true things, but they had a limited revelation of God, who, who he really is. So we can't give the pictures of God the same authority that we get in Jesus Christ in relation to the Old Testament. I want to do an illustration now and go into our commentary. Yes, if we can, please. Um, yep, and, yes, please, deacons. Can we hit those lights off too, please? Um, it is not dark enough. But can you use your imagination? If, he, if the world is dark, um, if the world is dark, can we hit that light off as well? Um, there's one more light. I don't know if you can. You can't? Okay. Just imagine it's pitch dark. What else can we have but a lamp? I'm going to suggest to you that the lamp could be, let's, let's go with this, the Old Testament um, or any other revelation that is not Jesus about God. Does that make sense? So is the candle useful in this stage? Is, would that be correct? Okay. Thank you, deacons. So if you can imagine I've got the torch, it's helpful. Now, turn the lights back on. When the lights are on, has this got any effect? Okay, I, I, don't want to tell, I don't want to tell you that um, I'm leading you on astray, so I want to make sure you got that clear. Okay, now we're going to go to our commentary, okay, um, on um, John 5.35. And this is what the, the scripture says. The Apostle John declares concerning John the Baptist, he was not that light. Rather, John the Baptist was a lamp as compared to Christ. Did you understand that? A lamp compared to Christ, who was, who was the true light. He, he, does that mean that John was a false light? Of course not. It just means he had um, a limited amount of revelation, but it is useful. Uh, now, now, 
As a lamp is no longer needed when the light of day has come, so the work of John was superseded by that of Jesus. Is that any clearer? That's from our commentary. That's from our commentary. So in other words, but this is the point, <laughs> um, if you don't get it, what are we going to use? I think it's better that we still use a lamp and I have to agree with that. Um, you watch now. Do you understand the point, what's, what's happened here? Um, Christ is the bright light. The lamp, it does not work, at, uh, it's useless when the sun comes out. Now that, that, that's from my commentary. Now if you see this spiritually, this is exactly what's happened. Now I want to go to Peter um, 2.119. All of this makes us even more certain that the prophets said are true. Is that correct? Do you understand that? No one's knocking the prophets. They have a use. So you should pay close attention to their message. Agreed? As you would... Now, here here comes the, the condition. As you would to a lamp shining in some dark place. You must keep on paying attention until... Until what? The daylight comes and the morning star rises in your hearts. Can, can anyone see a distinguish there? The lamp is useful. In, in what context? The darkness. Okay? Um, the one true reality of what God looks like is seen in the image of Jesus. If you miss this, you miss the revelation of who God is. You miss, let there be light. What, Jesus, what, was, what was Jesus' first words in the New Testament? Now we've got the Old Testament, so it's let there be light. What's his first words in the New Testament? It's a tricky one. Okay. But you're taught this, he speaks earlier. Yes. Can you say that loud because that's brilliant? Thank you. That's his first words. Um, do you, he's, he's talking to his mother. Do you not know that I, I must be about my father's business? If we go back to our commentary on PK717 on Let There Be Light, what did they say was the definition? He came to reveal the Father's character. What's, what's the first words in um, the New Testament? I, I just mind, I'm mind boggled what this sort of stuff. It's the same. He's telling the same story. There's no different story. It's the same story. Uh, John um, 3.18 Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they do not believe in God's only Son. What's his message? He's revealing the Father. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Light has come into the world to bring revelation so he can save us. Okay? I want you to have a look at something. that It's a deeper meaning of salvation, and I hope you see what I see. We're going to look at an Ellen White statement and I've just broken enough, I'm taking the middle part out of it. Um, this is a start and that's the ending and I want you to pick up something. Christ came to save fallen man and he's, she's going to reveal it to us how. Okay? The end of the statement, uh, okay, it's what is in between here. So I want to see what's in between these two points. That men might have salvation, he came directly to save man. So in between those two, we're going to read something, how he's going to save us. Okay? And we're going to go through it. Um, Because remember, there was a problem in the universe. According to PK717, um, he came to represent God. So obviously that is the answer to the problem in in the great controversy. Does that make sense so far? So now we're going to have a direct statement from Ellen White that you're going to see salvation. I hope you see it in a different light. As a candle compared to Christ. Um, Okay. Christ came to save fallen man. 
And Satan, with his fiercest wrath, met him on the field of conflict. For the enemy knew that when divine strength was added to human weakness, man was armed with power and intelligence and could break away from the captivity which he had been bound him. Does it make sense to you if there's a problem and Christ comes to reveal the Father, then that's the direct answer to the problem. That's what I'm thinking anyway. Satan sought to intercept every ray of light from the throne of God. He sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men might lose the true views of God's character. Here we have a problem. Um, God's been misrepresented and he came to reveal God. And that the knowledge of God might be uh, might be coming, and that, that the knowledge of God might become instinct to the earth, he had caused vi- truth vital importance to be so mingled with error that he would lost all its significance. The law of the Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. I just want to say a, a, a little side note here. If you go to our great controversy message with fundamental belief number eight, the main target is his character, the second is his law. In other words, his law is misunderstood. And if you notice here, Helm White says, with, um, it's got needless exactions and traditions. Just briefly, God's law is natural. It's not an imposed law. In other words, Jesus corrects it himself when he says the law is about love. The minute you break love... It's got natural consequences. But man has imposed the penalty which is external. So the punishment, uh, if you break the law, comes externally from, rather from internally. I hope you see the difference. I won't spend much time there. But ask me about it. I'm happy to share it with you. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in suffering of his, his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, this is just unreal. The one, the one evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Did you, did you see the twist here? This is the twist. Um, he, what we're up to? 21. Um, now listen, listen to the answer to the salvation problem. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of the earth. So how, where's salvation here? If God is misrepresented and he comes correctly to present him, are you saved from something? Hello, anyone out there? So he came to save us, to give us the true view of what God is like, because that's what bound us in the first place. An angel could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was in the living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish his mission. This is why, if you look at what Ellen White says, that they were placed in the framework of error, um, Jesus could not fail to accomplish his mission because he is God. He's the one who can reveal God. Um, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Their men might have salvation. Here's the last thing. He came directly to God. So what did he save us from? If we go to that quote, what did he save us from? If he came to represent God, what did he save us from? No, I can't hear. <coughs> About God. It's interesting because... Um, and if you have the right concept of God, it makes you free. Um, I've actually lost my place here a little bit, but anyway. Um, here we go. Those who had appreciated... The, uh, this is, I'm, I'm quoting all Alan White here. I'm not... I'm not um, making anything up here, those who had an appreciation of the character and mission of Christ, I want you to pick up the mission, his main mission, were reverence, filled with reverence and awe and they looked upon him and felt that they were looking upon the temple of the living God. So, and there's also a question is, what was his mission if this is what he came to reveal the Father? Wasn't his mission to reveal God? 
Now, are we, is, that, is that lamp language or daylight language? Remember the scripture says we like darkness. We like the lamp language. But I believe we're going to go to a higher plane by seeing uh, what the real salvation is all about. Um, Never a man spake like this man. They had seen that which the priests and rulers could not see. Humanity flooded with the light and glory of divinity. Those who would behold this glory would be drawn to love Jesus and to love the Father whom he represented. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him um, praise and giving him the credit of the whole per... Now listen to this. Was the whole purpose of his mission on the earth. I I want to stop there. You You have to take that in. What was, according to Alan White, unless she's mistaken... The whole purpose on his own mission on the earth was to reveal the Father. Now, to set men right through the revelation of God. Ellen White said that, I didn't say that. To me, that is so hugely profound. To me, that is daylight language. It is not candlelight language. Because mainly, we talk about sin all the time and it's all about me. But it's the revelation of God that's going to change us. Don't forget, we've still got that question, what is the greater thing that we're going to do that Jesus said we're going to do? And I believe that's why we were created. In Christ was arrayed, in Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfection of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested your name. Do you know what another word for name is? Glory or character. I have glorified thee on the earth. In the message it puts it this way, I have spelled out your character to deta- in detail. That's his mission. He came to reveal what God is like. Uh, I, can't remember, I think it was the NLT said, I revealed you, I revealed the Father, that's why he came. I have finished the work which thou have given me to do. If he finished the work, what did he just do? He revealed God to us. When the object of his mission was attained... The revelation of God to the world. I tell them what. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished. Um, can, we, can anyone see daylight here? Can, can you see the, the, the higher, um, um, high revelation here? And, the, and, the, and that the character of the Father might, might be made manifest to men. And the question is, why would you manifest the character of God to men? What's the problem? There is a problem here. We, don't we have a problem? The problem is we don't know God. And Jesus says this is to know eternal life. Um, now I want to read you a quote that this, about three or four years ago, um, hit me in a spot where it really changed a lot uh, in my own heart and it asked me to ask a lot of questions. I want to read it to you and I'm going to ask you the question, what's this got to do with let there be light? I'm going to read it. It is the darkness of mis- 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 pre- misinterpretation, sorry, misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Now that's the problem. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been un- misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating, which is light, um, in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy and truth. The last, ray, last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Now this is the last message to the world. What's this got to do with let there be light? Can I suggest to you they're the same? I just want you to confirm that because this is in our commentary again. On the same verse on let there be light, again, if you go to Ellen White's commentary, uh, comments at the back, it's got Christ's observation page 415 on let there be light. To me, this is just huge. Does anyone follow that? In other words, see what I see, this is the questions that I ask. Whatever happened, the problems that happen in heaven have to be addressed at some time, somewhere. And also, I believe, 
it's the same problem throughout, throughout history, wouldn't you say? Why would it be different? So the first message and the last message is the same. Is the same. And, and I believe as a movement, man, if we've been given some light, and remember what Isabella said, if we don't have deep roots and understand, we will be blown away because we need to understand what the issues are so we have deep anchors. So the problem with the universe is God's been misunderstood because we believe the lies of Satan. Remember Ellen White's quote, and I think I, I read it, I haven't got it with me today, said men fell because we believe the lies about God's government. Um, it, it's just interesting. Um, anyway, sorry, that just blew me away. I didn't have that last week um, I, to connect the two together. They do not believe because their minds have been kept in the dark by the evil God of this world. He keeps them from seeing the light shining on, on them. The light that comes from the good news about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. See, this is, this is the answer. God, did, did you want to say something? No. What, what has Christ got that, in that case um, that is so different. Well, he is the exact representation of God. Why do we need to see that? So we can love him and trust him. Simple. It's, it's, it's not very complicated. The Bible refers to the gospel as the good news um, um, of God. In, that's Romans 1. Um, the gospel is the good news of God's Son, um, the good news of God's grace, the gospel is all the good news about who God is. Um, now, this is another profound verse for me. The God who said, out of darkness the light shall shine. Where, where did he say that? Has anyone got, a, has anyone got Bibles with cross references? If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, and it says, out of, the darkness, of, the, out of darkness the light shall shine. Where's the direct uh, cross reference to? Can anyone have a look at that? Thank you. Now, but where, where does God want this light to shine? It is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts. Where, so, okay, let's compare candle with the light, the great light. What, what is more important, physical light or light shining in our hearts? It's very deep. But see, you only see this spiritually. If not, you can't see it. But the scripture says if you can't see, you use the lamp. Um, To bring us to the knowledge of of God's glory shining in whose face? Christ. So you're going to know God if you look to Jesus. Now I want to go back to my question. I tell you for certain that if you have faith in me, you will do the same things that I'm doing you will do even greater things now that I am going to the Father. Have you worked out how you will do greater things than Jesus? Has anyone worked that out? Look, I've thought about this for a long time, so I know it's not fair. But don't you think it's a a good question? Honestly, I mean, this is where where my spiritual life is. Um, I'll leave your hangings for a couple of minutes. If we go to Revelation 14.1, I looked in and saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. With him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's telling you something already. They had the character of Jesus and the character of the Father you've identified is the same. Okay, You've internalised that. Um, Okay, let me go back to the question. So have you worked out the greater things? I'll put you out of your misery. This is, look, this is just my own thinking. Now, if we go back three verses when Jesus says, you'll do greater things than me, look what he says. Um, I tell you for certain that if you have faith in me, you'll do greater, yeah, right. Now, Matthew 14, sorry, John 14, 9 says, Jesus replied, Philip, I have been with you for a long time. Do you not know who I am? You have seen me. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How can you ask me, show me the Father? I'm going to make... Look, 
I'm going to share with you what I think. It's not doctrine or anything like that. But if you have a better answer, please, I'd love to hear it. This is where I am on my spiritual journey. If Jesus' main mission is to come to the earth and show us the Father, remember he says, now that I go back to the Father, what does he leave us to do here on the earth? Thank you. But hang on a minute. There's something that's huge here that I saw for my own part. Yes, but hang on a minute. If Jesus being a, a, a perfect, pure being reveals God and then he gets someone out of darkness to reveal God, I think that is greater. That's the only thing I can think of. But please, if you have a better answer, I'm, I'm all ears. I want to hear it. This is where on my journey. I don't want to make it. It's not a doctrine. This is what I see. I see our mission. And I think that's like a trump card because we were created after the fall, after sin entered the universe, and now we are going to stand up for God. Yes. What things, what, what things are possible? Okay, thank you. It's not complicated. It's very easy. Okay. Carry it through. What, what, things, are, what things are you talking about possible? Um, Laurie? Um, let me suggest to you, let there be light. If you agree with it, I'll agree with you on that point. Um, all things are possible. A sinner can reflect God. I can't think of this as a greater thing, but that's fine. Thank you. Now, what's this? The last message. Revelation 18, one. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. I want you to listen to this. The earth was lightened with his glory. Do you see the two? From the beginning, the earth was dark. And God says, let there be light. Now you have a message where the earth is lightened with his glory. I'd say mission accomplished or checkmate. Um, the first message is about let there be light and the last is about, about message is the light illuminating the whole earth with the light of God's glory. And guess what else I found? Go to Revelation, if we go to our commentary, Revelation 18.1, Look what it says. The glory may be thought of as representing the character of God. Here in particular is revealed in the plan of salvation. This is our commentary. It links it again. Um, now, I want to, this is my last scripture. Um, to me, this has been a huge prayer of mine, and I'll tell you why. God's mission was to say, let there be light so the whole earth uh, and the universe... The universe saw the truth about God on, on, um, on the cross because if you follow Jesus' prayer, it says, um, let, let his will be done in heaven, uh, sorry, his, his will done on the earth as it is in heaven. In other words, in heaven is understood, but not, not here on the earth. He's on a mission to reveal the Father, right? And I can't wait that that's going to happen. I think it's already in process, but... On the counter, I want, to watch, I, want to, I want you to have a look at Habakkuk 2.14 because this is the answer to let there be light. I want you to have a look at it. But the earth, remember the earth was the dark place that Satan claimed as his. Do you follow that? But no more. We'll be a full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as what? The seas are full of water. Remember the spirit was hovering over the water? This is reversal. I can't wait. That's, to me, it's just amen. In the, earth, the earth, in, in the end, the earth will be that was dark and Satan's will will be no more because the earth will be full of the knowledge of God's glory as the seas are full of water. And all I can say is amen. I just hope that you saw something deep today, that we can have some deep roots, that we can address deep spiritual meaning. Um, yes? Say that again. What you say? Is? Is to understand. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you so much. If we understand God, there's only one thing that we can do. Love him and tell, tell who God is. He's not um, the mean God that um, Satan's made him out to be. Right, look, if you've got any questions, want to ask me any questions, please do so. I've only given you a snippet. 
Excellent. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, Amen. Thank you. Just a small announcement, which I forgot to mention. Um, For any visitors, um, there's a luncheon at the back. If you're more than welcome, please bear your heads for a benediction. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, it is at a great price that you came to reveal who you are. And it pleased you to send Jesus to this earth, to be mistreated by um, your creation, to reveal who you really are. We thank you for the gift that Jesus is exactly you. And we can trust him because this is exactly who you are. It is the same God that's going to come back to see us. And Lord, when he comes back, we don't have to run. We run to to him. Lord, we pray, Lord, that um, hearts have just been ignited with a little flame and that the Holy Spirit will do his work. And please bless us. And Lord, thank you so much for this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.